Olá, estamos começando mais um Boteco Behaviorista, hoje com um convidado super especial, que é o Steven Reis. Uh, e justamente por a gente estar com esse convidado de fora, nós estaremos, vamos tentar falar em inglês e fazer o boteco todo em inglês. Então, se você está assistindo a gente e não conseguir acompanhar, é, nós faremos legendas e postaremos o vídeo com legenda no YouTube depois. Mas agora, por enquanto, a gente começa a falar inglês. And for the international speakers, welcome to our behaviorist bar. Uh, behaviorist bar. <laughs> And well, I guess we can start as usual, introducing ourselves from the left to the right. Roberta. Okay, I'm Roberta Kovac from Nucleo Paradigma de Análise do Comportamento in São Paulo, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've been studying RFT and ACT for, for a while now, and it's a pleasure to, to have Steve and make the questions that I always wanted to, to make to him in person or uh, online. <laughs> Cesar. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Cesar Rocha. I'm Brazilian psychologist. Uh, master in psychology and one of the creators of the behaviorist bar. So welcome everybody. Desiree? Well, my name is Desiree Casado. I'm from Sorocaba, São Paulo. I dedicated myself to clinical work and it, it's been some years since I started to work and study with ACT. I spent some years in Spain working and studying with Camilo Luciano. And I'm really glad to be here with you all, you guys, and, and Steve. Oh, I'm Felipe Epaminondas. I am a psychologist, clinical psychologist, and one of the creators of Boteco Behaviorista, along with Cesar Rocha. And that's it, Marcela. Hello, I'm Marcela. I'm f I am from Manaus. I'm a psychologist, and it's going to be an adventure because. I really not. I am not comfortable of speaking English, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Mika. Mika has a slight problem uh, with the webcam, but hi, Mika. Hi, uh, hi, Steve. Hi, people. I, I have uh, some difficult with technology. Uh, or, uh, but I, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I love art. Um, And uh, I'm a teacher as well, and I'm very happy to be here with you guys today. Mika has a book about ACT, the only book in Portuguese about ACT. It's a very nice book. Gente mm. importante. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Rodrigo? Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Rodrigo Boavista. I'm a Brazilian psychologist as well. And I'm completing my master's degree in PUC in São Paulo. I'm studying RFT, and I've been studying ACT for around three years, or maybe four, four years. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. It's a, a great honor. Thanks for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to debate this topic with you guys. And last but not least, second Hayes. Hi, I'm Steve Hayes, and I'm a clinical psychologist. I also do basic research uh, on uh, verbal behavior, language and cognition. That would be the way I'd describe it to non-behavioral people. Um, and I've been in Brazil many times, um, even before uh, marrying my uh, beautiful wife, who's a gaúcha. <laughs> I'll show you the scars later. <laughs> but uh, um, she's from Rio Grande do Sul. But I, I uh, uh, first went to Brazil, I think, um, oh golly, almost 20 years ago, and organized a conference uh, with uh, behaviors from around the, the, the country, which led to a book that uh, you can get on language and cognition from a behavioral point of view. And uh, spent time in many places at USP and um, San Carlos and uh, uh, Belém and uh, different places. 
uh, and then I have visited a couple times more. Actually, I did an ACT workshop there, I think, almost 20 years ago. I didn't exactly take because it was too early, but um, so uh, Brazil is in a very important country uh, to me personally, but not just uh, to that, I think to, uh, to the world and in the area of psychology increasingly so. And so it's a, a real uh, happy thing for me to spend time with you. And especially I like uh, spending time with behaviorists. You know, a lot of the ACT work is reaching out to people who are not necessarily behavioral and uh, doing it in ways that um, don't create barriers. Uh, but uh, it's good to come back to my home base. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to some interesting uh, conversation. Yeah, so we invited Stephen Hayes because he's an important figure in ACT history. Uh, Cesar, what do you think? How do we start our discussion today? I guess it would be nice to start... It would be nice if we start uh, talking about the... They the start? Roots. The roots? The, 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 roots. How, how did it all begin? the roots? The historical roots of ACT. How did it all begin? And okay, the roots. Besides this, uh, in your book, Stephen, with uh, that one with the blue cover, <laughs> you started talking about the importance of philosophy to the psychotherapist. Yes. So I would like to hear from you uh, the historical roots of ACT, how did it all begin, and after that, the, the importance of philosophy for it and, and contextualism. Okay. Isn't behavior analysis a contextual science? Is ACT only a model that can be made within a uh, contextual psychology? Isn't behavior analysis a contextualistic science? Are we mechanistic? So if you can start talking about that. Okay. Uh, as far as the roots, I mean, um, uh, okay. It, there's, there's several, but uh, as a graduate student, I uh, became convinced that behavior analysis needed to do a better job with uh, language and cognition. At the time, I was very enchanted with uh, Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, and I thought that maybe could be the basis for what needed to happen. Uh, I was influenced especially by people like Willard Day and uh, other of the philosophical radical behaviorists who in hindsight I would say were contextualistic. Um, but Willard in particular, he was at the University of Nevada where I am now, but I was at, in training at West Virginia University and as a student, very charismatic man, he, he gave a talk there. And uh, uh, I, I walked out of that talk thinking he's exactly right, we have to understand language or, or behavioral psychology will not be able to move forward. And I tried the things as a young professor that others have tried of applying verbal behavior in ways that might directly speak to clinical work, but to do so in a rigorous way. And I became somewhat uh, dissatisfied with it um, because I couldn't find a way to enter into it empirically. I, I began work doing work, well not began, but quickly within a few years ended up doing work on rule governed behavior and the effect that it had on direct contingencies. I published several studies in JAB and so forth which are still very well cited and put, produced a book and uh, one of Skinner's last uh, chapters was for that book. It was uh, in uh, the late 80s. But the pivot point intellectually there is Skinner's units all require, or almost all of them require, a good definition of what a verbal stimulus is. And uh, Skinner produced a kind of inconsistency, I believe, between his view of rules, which are contingency specifying stimuli, but he never specified what specification meant. And he said the behavior of the listener is not verbal. And so specification can't mean something for the listener. And then, on the one, on the one hand, on the other hand, his definition of verbal behavior, uh, which it, uh, uh, especially includes the definition of verbal stimuli, 
as stimuli that are the products of verbal behavior, which is completely unlike any other definition of stimulus. So that's one intellectual thing. I understand language. I'm trying to do research on it. I have a problem with an inconsistency which my future wife and now ex-wife Linda Parrott really pointed out very clearly. I think she was one of the first. I actually saw her debate, Fred Skinner, and I think won the debate uh, in what I saw at ABBA that he could not put together his definition of rule government behavior on the one hand, his definition of verbal behavior on the other. Then the other thing that happened with ACT is I developed a panic disorder myself. And uh, it grew very, very quickly over a period of a couple of years to the point where I couldn't function really. As an academic psychologist, I had a very hard time giving lectures, traveling, doing even the most basic things, uh, leaving town, going across bridges, sitting in restaurants, riding the elevator. And I applied the things that I knew to apply. And it wasn't until I went back to things that were more from my hippie days of uh, Eastern ideas and ideas from the human potential movement that I got traction on it. And that was very interesting to me. So I started doing research on how to loosen up the insens insensitivity to direct contingencies that can happen uh, due to rule governed behavior on the one hand. And on the other, a base trying to understand what is a verbal stimulus, which led over a period of years to, not very, very many years, but over a period of years to uh, stimulus equivalence and then to a theory of that and then to relational frame theory. Uh, the, um, and so I can walk through ACT and all of that, but the basic uh, the basis of it is uh, both intellectual and personal and, and really sits on that issue of what do we do with language and cognition from a behavior and the point of view. On the philosophy side of things, if you're going to walk into this territory of meaning and purpose and uh, um, symbolic effects, verbal effects, you better be clear of your philosophical assumptions because uh, you can easily fall into views of language which are driven not by your technical analysis but by the culture itself. And the culture treats language as if it is, refers to things that it's a, a kind of a modeling of the pre-partitioned world mentally. A Skinner objected to that and had the view that meaning is use. If you really are clear on that, essentially what you're doing, and it, this is what was radical in my opinion about radical behaviors, is that you apply that also to the verbal behavior of the scientist. And if you really, if you think about it, really what you're doing when you do that is you move from a kind of model that's based on physics to a model that's based on biology. You know, the queen theory in biology is evolution. And what works, selection by its consequences, are what drives all of the phenotypic development that you see. If you take a, a evolutionary epistemology seriously, which I think Skinner did, then you keep looking at your own languaging in terms of what it buys you, what it gives you as far as uh, being able to accomplish what you want to accomplish with this tool. And so Skinner has very strange quotes, you know, strange only if you think of them as a mechanist, you know, like he, here's a quote from Skinner. Uh, I'm not saying that there is no mind. I'm saying that concept gets in the way of more important things. What a strange thing to say. I mean, I was, I've, been in, I've been in the room with behaviorists who just say, there is no mind, eh, like that. And they think that's winning the argument. Skinner didn't say that. He doesn't even want to engage the issue. He's not saying, when, I, when he says, I'm not saying there is no mind, he's not saying there is a mind understand. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, I don't deal with these issues of existence. I'm just a humble person functioning in and with. Here's another Skinner quote. The real world, and he puts parentheses and he says, or at least the one world. Why, why would he put those parentheses? Why didn't he just say, the real world, there's no mind? Because from an evolutionary point of view, we're just swimming in and with the one stream. And it's just a matter of 
what we do and what we get. And so it, you keep coming back even to your own behavior as a scientist, as a clinician, a variation in selection is your core, even when you're looking at how language works. So uh, we worked out over a period of years some clarity of that and trying to drill down to the functionalistic, uh, to the contextualistic and more mechanistic roots that are in behavioral thinking, uh, uh, helping to discriminate them, and then making some distinctions between some forms of contextualism that I call descriptive, people like Cantor, and some forms that I call functional, people like Skinner. Functional contextualism is just my words for radical behaviorism, but, it fra but the, it's not just a change in terms. It really helps you to see, I think, what the essence of this philosophy is, at least the way I understand it, the way I was trained. And so what I'm doing now in ACT and the Contextual Behavioral Science Community, which is our name for our scientific development strategy, is to carry behavior analysis forward with clarity about these assumptions and with uh, behavioral principles and the addition of, uh, a, I think, a relatively adequate functional analytic account of human language and cognition, which is relational frame theory. And that's really what I, I'm most interested in. I care about ACT, but I really am most interested in the larger tradition it's part of and whether or not we can advance it. I'm sorry for such a long answer, but it's a it's a difficult and complicated question. So. Not I I couldn't hear you, Cesar. Can you repeat, please? Is this said any other questions? No, no. I, I said that, that that was a great answer. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a so great uh, quote of Skinner. <laughs> Skinner. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that quote. That's new Those to me. Those quotes, strange quotes. Yeah. So, I have a uh, lot Skinner. of Skinner. I, the things that Skinner I like are these little asides. You know, he's typing and then he says, says things. And if you read a lot of them, and I've read a lot of them, they jump out at you like, the, why would you say that little comment on the side? And sometimes it shows, I think, so, a lot, a lot of where he's coming from. Nice. You know, Stephen, I don't know if you agree with him, but Brian Moxley says he used to say that uh, there was two Skinners, one modern, one postmodern. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's a contextualistic and other mechanistic. Do you agree with Moxley? Yeah, he, he was. No, I do agree, and he had those strands in him. Uh, a way I've said it is the most interesting part of Skinner's work, the part that I think is most progressive, is the part that you're calling postmodern. Uh, be careful, of course, with the word postmodern, because people then immediately think of some extremes of postmodernism, of uh, social constructionism, for example, which is fine, but you can take it to this crazy place where, uh, you know, true, you know, there's no difference between equals mc squared and uh, uh, you know making rude noises. I mean, come on, these are very different things in terms of what you can do with them. And I understand what they're trying to do, but but yeah, no Skinner, especially as he goes forward, he becomes more and more pragmatic, more and more contextualistic. Uh, I think more sophisticated uh, and interesting. Because if he is a mechanist, he's, he's a very uninteresting one. I mean, why wouldn't you be a traditional cognitive psychologist if you're a mechanist? You have such a wonderful machine, a computer. I mean, Skinner's, if he's a mechanist, he has something more like the hydraulic statuary of the Middle Ages. It's a very boring uh, a form of psychology, if you think of it that way. You know, stimulus, response. He always objected to that, I thought. But there are good behavior analysts who swear that's what he meant. You know, okay, I hope you uh, are able to do something with that take on him, but I was never able to do anything with it, and especially I was never able to do anything very interesting with my clients, or frankly with myself when I was suffering. It just didn't give me the traction that these more radically pragmatic ideas gave that I found in, in his writing. So we really do have not just two forms of Skinner, but in the field we have two different uh, ways of interpreting him, and he's dead now, and he won't be able to clear it up himself. 
but uh, you know we move on I mean we honor the, the people whose shoulders we stand on but it's our responsibility not out of narcissism or arrogance but out of um, uh, progress in the, the caring about moving forward to make some choices and to not uh, simply try to live up to the views of our heroes but to do things that are effective here and now right in front of us for the people we serve. I guess Rodrigo has a question. Rodrigo. Yes, I have. Uh, Stephen, um, as long as I know, uh, ACTIVE began as a, a, something called uh, comprehensive distancing and Correct. I think it was uh, your trial uh, beside Bob Zettel to translate cognitive techniques into Skinnerian terms. Um, how was the, this process? What make uh, what has made you think about it? Was it yeah. necessary? Well, do understand. I mean, we're I start out as a traditional behavior therapist, and I am trained as a behavior analyst. Uh, I mean, I'm old enough that. I was literally sitting in with a professional psychologist watching desensitization sessions in 1966. Well, Behavior Research and Therapy is the first behavioral journal. That's 1963. So three years after behavior therapy starts, really, I'm already part of this field. And I was also there and very active, uh, for example, with AABT, the Association for Advancement of Behavior Therapy, which is now the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy in the US, the major, uh, and I saw that shift from behavior therapy to uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, and I was most, was most interested in the more behavior analytic part of behavior therapy, which at the time when I was trained, they met together, worked together, they split later on. Behavior analysis becomes separate, behavior therapy, then cognitive behavior therapy. By the time I'm a faculty member, the cognitive wave has, you know, washed almost everything away that uh, I thought was uh, uh, important. But I washed it away. But it overwhelmed it. I mean, people, uh, uh, maybe uh, the young people don't understand, it may, and maybe it was different in different countries. In fact, I think in Brazil, maybe not quite in the same way. But... Uh, <coughs> What we wrote about early on was how you could use some of these Skinnerian ideas about rule governing behavior, for example, and understand some of what uh, cognitive therapists and early cognitive behavior therapists were trying to do. And to do that without any appeal to mentalistic concepts or anything like that, that you could really do it in a fairly, well, maybe not tight, but a pretty good uh, behavioral uh, way. But when I came to believe that we should first start focusing on how to reduce the dominance of rules to the point that it overwhelmed our sensitivity to other direct contingencies, which was sort of the beginning of that. Uh, and then I looked at CBT, I could see that there's a little piece in there that could have that in there. Uh, Beck's concept of distancing was a matter of sort of backing up, noticing that you're thinking, right? And then right away starting having little behavioral homework and things like that, that really basically before there's any challenging, disputing, changing of the, we might say, rules the person's following, would challenge the degree to which it had to dominate over behavior. So if a person, let's say in session one or two of cognitive therapy would say, I can't do anything, I'm completely, you know, I'm so incompetent, you know, they say, well, what would you want to do? I can't even make breakfast for the family anymore. I'm, okay, well, let's see, let's do a little behavioral homework and see, is it possible, could you fix uh, some eggs for your children? And so we would have these thoughts, that we'd focus on and a, and a behavioral experiment. Well, that is a very sensible thing from a behavioral point of view. If you think that rules are too dominant, of immediately getting in touch with the context and seeing how dominant they are. Now, Beck did it so that he could then 
detect, challenge, dispute, and change. I thought that was a bad idea because uh, everything that I knew about rule-governed behavior would say the more you focus on it, the more central it is. It isn't, you know, it, remember the early rule, I don't know if you know the units we came up with, but early on we came up with units like clients and counterclients. Clients is a rule governed behavior that's reinforced by the social community for the apparent correspondence between the rule and relevant behavior. Uh, Counterpliance is still, you know, I'll show them, I'm not going to do what they tell me, you know, the kind of thing teenagers do. And people have realized for a long time that rebellion and compliance are really two phases of the same process, I think. Because you're still focusing on the rule giver. You know, the reinforcers are still, whether or not that correspondence is one way or the other, it's the same basic thing. It's just that one has a different face to it. Uh, well, uh, when you kind of see that functional idea, and now you look at Beck's work, let's say, well, Beck was very interested in the form of the thought. Like, is it an error? Is it rational or not rational? Ellis, of course, very much that way, too. Not so much the function. He didn't have good language for the function of it. Uh, it's a little unfair for me to say that because he has some things in there. But So you see in the early work, not that we were trying to say, hey, we ought to go be CBT people. Look, we can talk about these things behaviorally. This wasn't sort of a Dollard and Miller uh, reinterpretation of psychoanalysis to go to something that happened decades earlier that another wing of behaviorism did. It was more by way of saying to cognitive folks, the behavioral work has something important for you that might help you maybe find more effective things. So we called it comprehensive distancing because our idea was this. You could take that little piece that Beck had, link it to these behavioral thinking, and instead of diving into detecting, challenging, disputing, and changing, which wouldn't necessarily change the functional unit, like if I'm resisting a rule versus complying with a rule, it might even still be the same functional unit. Instead, I might want to find a way to kind of diminish its dominance and allow other sources of behavioral regulation to begin to take hold, such as the contingencies linked to reinforcers that are really important for you. Well... Uh, we call it comprehensive distancing because our idea is we could take this little thing, make it huge, take all the rest of the stuff, put it to the side, and then mix it with um, more traditional behavioral ideas and come up with a good package. And, it, and that, that's the core of ACT. I mean, it now has other things on it that have amplified that idea. But that's really uh, where it started was uh, not so much... Uh, extending cognitive therapy ideas as showing that behavioral ideas had some overlap but a whole lot of new implications. And that's been true. I think the third wave folks, the more contextualistic folks, have been able to, to really uh, walk right inside now into the CBT universe and uh, and shake the cage a little bit. I mean, you, you, it's it's really neat to see that, you know, behavioral activation is back. Skills training with DBT is back. Uh, you know, uh, the values work sort of uh, really empowers a lot of the uh, more uh, behavioral things that we're used to doing. Exposure, ACT is basically an exposure method, but it's exposure with a purpose not of emotional reduction and habituation, but of uh, something more like Izzy Goldiamond would talk about, of uh, response amplification and uh, increasing response flexibility in the presence of repertoire narrowing stimuli, which I think much better fits the data on how exposure works than these old ideas of emotion goes down, behavior goes up. It's not like that. It's far more than that. And, uh, so that was, that was the purpose, and uh, over 30 years, that's what's happened, sort of to a degree. 
Again, another long answer if I do this all the whole time. <laughs> You'll ask, you can ask three questions. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, you know, Steve, I, I think perhaps much of the resistance against ACT here, um, Brazil, is that we, um, in the behavior analysis community, has to do a lot with the use of middle terms like acceptance, yes. value, diffusion, mindfulness, you know. And we know that our RFT research is working and committed to describe those processes on behavioral terms. But what do we know so far? And uh, if we take acceptance, for example, yeah. uh, what behavioral process are we talking about when we talk about acceptance? What goes under that? When I do uh, when I do a procedure about acceptance with my client, oh. What behavioral process am I looking for? Should I be looking for? Okay. Um, so you have a that's another complex question that probably give you a long answer. But uh, one of the and, uh, just one second. I think yes. Roberta wants to to. No, it's just that I've I've been following the uh, act list serve and yes. serve, and you are discussing it a lot over there, and I wanted to talk to, to say just that. I've been seeing the openers that you are dealing with this uh, subject, and yeah. I want to know what they're going to say. Yeah, there's a lot of openness in the community as to how best to do this. The middle level terms idea was something that really goes back to the beginning of ACT. If you want to pick, a, if, and RFT, if you want to pick the uh, first article on ACT and RFT, it would be an article in the journal Behaviorism called Making Sense of Spirituality. It's a philosophy article. Mm -hmm. But the basic argument there is we shouldn't say, oh, this is not behavioral uh, because it violates our assumptions. To, it's dualistic. You know, Wait a minute. Skinner's view is meaning is use. So any term, if you say God, it doesn't mean it's not natural just because you said it. Uh, you, know, you don't look in the dictionary to do a behavior analysis. Okay? So I thought it was bad behavior analysis to just reject terms because they literally contradicted behavioral terms. A better behavior analysis is to look at how the terms are used, the conditions under which they use, and the functions that they have. And I tried to do that with you know a term that is as far away from natural science as you can get, spirituality. And it seemed to me to be saying something quite reasonable. You can go read the article, but uh, that opened the door to this idea. If you really take a radically pragmatic view of uh, language, what would be the harm of having multiple language systems for different purposes and for different audiences if you are doing it knowledgeably and deliberately and you had as your goal uh, integrating these things over time without the assumption that any particular middle level term will survive that analysis. So for example, if you say spirituality orients you towards a key feature of human psychology, which I think it does, I think it orients you, orients you toward the, the uh, seeing, seeing from a perspective or point of view. I'm deliberately saying seeing, seeing because Skinner wrote an article saying you know, nonverbal organisms see, verbal organisms see that they see. And I tried to add, and not just that, they see that they see from a perspective or point of view. Of from where? From I, here, now. And the early idea about didactic frames and so forth was in that 1984 article. Now, as you unpack it, it could be that a term, let's say, like spirituality, falls apart and you no longer have any use for it because you have a technical account that gives you other terms that are more that are superordinate or that break it into pieces. But you should be humble about this. You shouldn't you know beat your chest and say only our basic terms are useful. I mean I, I lived through an era when we thought we had in order for parents to do parent training with their kids they had to learn all these behavioral terms. What a nightmare. Why? It's hard for students to learn these terms. To this day, you cannot distinguish positive and negative reinforcement in 90% of the psychology students. 
why are we fighting this with parents? Even poor parents with limited education, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. How, couldn't we come up with easier terms? I don't care what they are, as long as they accomplish our goal. Now, the middle-level term of acceptance, but what I mean by middle-level terms, and I deliberately use something about as humble as you can get, we didn't even give them a fancy name, is, is that these are terms that orient you towards a domain in which there are sets of functional analyses that help you function within that domain. But it is not a technical term because it has not been fully dissembled into its functional categories linked to high precision, high scope behavioral principles. And by behavioral principles, I include RFT principles. That's, I, I want, I'm not just direct contingencies. Direct contingencies are 450 million years old. Rule governed behavior is not 450 million years old. It's about 200,000 or 100,000 years old, or at maximum two, two and a half million years old. So I want you know both of those things in there. We've always used middle level terms in behavior analysis. Take something like aggression. What's aggression? Well, there's no very tight definition of aggression. It orients you towards a domain. And inside that domain, there may be an analyses, you know, like, oh, okay, there's pain elicited aggression. There's aggression that comes from a radical reduction in density of reinforcement. You know, uh, you know that there's sensory uh, uh, reinforcers involved in attack are prepotentiated as an establishing operation by uh, aversive events. I mean, there's all these things that are, are useful, animal and, and human, but you couldn't right now say that the word aggression is a technical term in behavioral psychology, I don't think. Acceptance is like that. Now, what is acceptance right now? I would say this. The thing that it most focuses on is this. If you want to pick the two biggest insensitivity-inducing processes known to psychology, they would be rule-governed behavior and avoidance. I don't think that's a hard case to make. And for all kinds of good behaviorally sensible reasons. Acceptance points to the place where these come together, which is this rule-based attempt to avoid psychological events and the situations that indicate that they're about to occur. Thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations. Uh, to attempt to regulate your life and regulate your behavior by avoiding those things. Many, many of our uh, forms of so-called psychopathology are simply rule-based avoidance that has gone too far, and especially it's gone into areas that are uh, loosely within the skin and which produce this kind of uh, self-accelerating process. As I avoid it, I actually increase the stimulus control of the events that are avoiding that you're avoiding, so that if you have a feeling of anxiety and then you run away as a panic disordered person in recovery, if I got a call and somebody said, uh, "Come give this talk," and when I was fighting with my panic disorder, I'd say, "Oh no, no, my students would be so much better," and I'd tell myself a story. It's because I'm such a loving mentor that I'm giving this opportunity to students. Actually, it's just because I'm too terrified to speak in front of groups. As soon as I did that, I felt better. I felt like, oh, that's great. But of course, the stimulus control exerted by this cl loose collection of things we call anxiety, these bodily sensations, thoughts, etc., was going up, not down, as any clinician could tell you. So acceptance is a term for what happens when you uh, let go of and instead turn in the opposite direction of rule-based experiential avoidance. And um, uh, I think it's a good middle-level term. It, it makes behavioral sense. It's not fully unpacked, though. How did, where did that come from? Where did these rules come from? Why are they so powerful? Mm -hmm. um, that requires the full account. And, and there, you really, you know, you start getting to things like transformation of stimulus functions. So, for example, it's, let's take um, Mike Dewar's study in which he trains 
A is less than B is less than C. Okay? Arbitrary squiggles, arbitrary contextual cues, traditional RFT preparation. Another group doesn't get that training. Now you take the B stimulus and you shock a person repeatedly when it's shown. And then they present the A stimulus or the C stimulus. The A stimulus in both groups elicits no arousal. The B stimulus in both groups, one that's relationally trained, one that's not, elicits a lot of arousal. The C stimulus, you know, A is less than B is less than C, elicits very little arousal in the group that's not relationally trained and elicits more arousal than the stimulus you were repeatedly shocked to in the presence of the group that was relationally trained. Well, there's no behavioral term for that. Without RFT terms, and this is one thing I, I hope you don't feel criticized, but when I've been to Brazil, because Brazil had this behavior analytic thing with uh, this lovely man who I very much miss, uh, Fred Keller, and and then all the people, Maria Maria Matos and Daisy de Souza and Julia de Rose and all the people, behaviorists that I have met there in Brazil going back over many years. Because clinical was so much based on behavioralytic thinking on the one hand, and there was, in my opinion, not a good technical account of language and cognition on the other. You had to distort basic behavioral terms to talk about the kind of thing I just described or to understand what we're doing right now. And so when I've described things like that in Brazil, people say, oh, it's generalization. I say, wait a minute. No, you can't say it's generalization. Generalization requires, a, if you're talking stimulus generalization, requires a stimulus gradient, requires the evolutionary history of the organism that established these things that's similar so that, you know, red is, is sort of like orange, is uh, sort of like yellow, is uh, sort of like green, sort of like blue, sort of like, you know, because these wavelengths of light are organized in a visual system in a way that it makes perfect sense. Or response generalization, the same thing. You can't just take effects like, uh, you know, uh, and say it's generalization. Well, then I've heard people say, oh, well, it's association. I say, wait a minute, A is as associated to B as C is associated to B. You can't say association for the same thing. Oh, well, then it's stimulus control over association. Okay. Now, this is what Palmer does, actually, in his criticism of RFT. He does exactly that, but he's a mechanist. It makes sense that he would try to do it. But in, if you read his criticism, he then says, but we can't do research on this. It's too complicated. And I would say, hey, well, then, I don't know why I should be interested. I mean, I want something I can do research about, and not just to be doing research, but I want an analysis that allows me to predict and control, as the way Skinner said it, the way I say it, because it's, I think, more politically astute and more correct, to predict and influence with precision, scope, and depth. That's what I want. I think that's what Skinner wanted. And uh, so, uh, middle-level terms help orient us to it, but we still have to do the basic account. When we finish the basic account, they may be eliminated. We no longer need that middle-level term. They may be reorganized. They're now chunked in different ways. But we shouldn't wait. The, the thing that's inside CBS, we call it a reticulated model. Reticulated meaning network, like a reticulated giraffe, you know, a network. Mm -hmm. So that the applied people move forward, the basic people move forward, they keep talking, and mm -hmm. the, the entire community has the responsibility that it has to fit together in the long term. But not right now. Right now, let's see. And data are data. Data at the level of, for example, if I know that psychological flexibility mediates act outcomes, I can change it and good things happen. That's a fact on the ground. It requires an analysis. And if there's no good RFT account of that now, that's a problem with RFT. It's not a problem with the analysis at the level of a plot. But as the community, it's a problem for the whole community because we want it all to fit together. So 
uh, we don't tell the applied people wait until we figure out the basic. We don't tell the uh, basic people it's your responsibility to tell us what to do. Each of us has responsibility for the whole. And uh, the whole is, uh, uh, the way we say it in CBS, is creating a psychology more adequate to the challenge of the human condition. And we want an analysis that, that is technically sound and uh, vigorously useful in application. And I'll, I'll just say one more thing about middle level terms. You know, I can walk into a group of psychoanalysts, a group of Gestalt people, a group of humanists, a group of existentialists, and I can talk, act, and nobody is running for the door. <laughs> and, if, and, if they, and if they stay in the room, if they stay in the room, and you see this in the CBS community, within two years they will know behavioral principles to a degree. If you look, this, was, this shocked me when I looked, if you look at the, the book uh, Learning RFT, okay, and then look to, on Amazon to see what are the books that are linked to it. It has people who buy this book also buy this other book, okay? Mm -hmm. The third book in line is a book on psychoanalysis. <laughs> now you show me another Amazon screen with a basic behavioral book where the third book in line is a psychoanalysis book. And you know, I got people out there in basic behavior analysis who just want to just torture me. I mean, some of my heroes, I won't mention names, but major, major painted by Skinner and so forth, say, you're ruining behavior analysis, you're, you know, you're a traitor. You're... I mean, I literally get emails with those words in writing from my heroes. And it's very painful. But I come back and say, look, gang, you say you want behavioral thinking in the culture? Yeah. You point to me who's doing more to put behavioral thinking in the culture. If you want to live in a ghetto, go live in a ghetto. But, you know, meanwhile, there's people who need our work, and we need to find ways to speak in a more Catholic way, with a small c, well, in a more I universal think, way. I agree. I think, I think the only thing is that for our, our community, <laughs> need to be clear, the connection between RFT and, and the, act term, the act terms, which it's pretty clear right now. And it's, I'd it's, say not just RFT, but also bakes, basic behavioral principles. Yes, I think exactly, you, one, exactly. one reason I'm excited to talk to a group of behaviorists is that you have a right to say, that term right there, what is that? And if you're going to use a term, you know, like mind or spirituality or transcendent sense of self or values, all these terms that we just use, you have to be able to sort of say, stop, it's okay. Here, here's how this sort of fits into the things that are going on in this more basic account. And I think we're prepared to do that. I'm prepared to do that. If you have any that don't... don't yeah, especially fit, because... See if you can th throw the ball by me. See if I can hit it. <laughs> I would love the challenge. I, I really don't think there's any major term in act writing or thinking that isn't behaviorally sensible enough that it belongs in the conversation now. Later on, some of them will fall away. Now, I, I'm not arguing that every lay term is useful. I'm not making that argument. I'm, but I am arguing that we shouldn't be frightened of terms because they're supposedly, literally dualistic. That's not the behavioral way. The behavioral way is to look at meaning and use. When, you, when you're using technical terms, yes, of course, it's not a technical term. That's a different purpose, though. So if you think that there's any that don't fit, let me know. We'll see. <laughs> Did my analysis of acceptance feel proper to you? Did that make behavioral sense to you? Yes, it does. Really good. And, you know, uh, we have a really strong tradition in functional behavioral therapy in Brazil, including yes. uh, behavioral therapy that are developed here, yes. actually. And they all have are heavily based on functional analysis of, con of contingences yes. and in a very Skinnerian way. Do you think these approaches are compatible with ACT 
or how ACT can improve the clinical practice of those behavioral I, therapists? I hope so. If you know, and it's a good question. If we come into work with common assumptions, so I'm claiming that the uh, functional contextualism is the assumption of at least a very large wing of behavior analysis. Not every behavior analyst, but a very large wing. With really with no modification. It's just different ways of languaging about it, but uh, because sometimes Skinner is unclear, I thought, and we you know we've tried to make it clear. When you have common assumptions and, and a common goal, then it's easy to come together and say, hey, I'm doing this, uh, look at what so they have doing this, look what it does. And you can share, you can mix, you can try different things. One of the things that we've done in the ACT work is from the very beginning, as we said, ACT is not just a technology, it's an approach based on a model, based on a scientific development strategy, based on a philosophy, and a set of theoretical <laughs> ideas. You know, if, if you want to call it something different, or you want to add or subtract or mix, or that's fine. Uh, you know, there are right now, you know, Joe uh, Croce is uh, just immediately past president, I guess, of, uh, of ACBS. He called ACT in his organizational work mindfulness-based emotional intelligence training. <laughs> because he's, he's working in organizations and he has some knowledge of emotional intelligence and this is a good way to get in and be able to do the work. Well. We're not going to say, oh, you traitor, you didn't call it ACT. So I would say pull ACT apart, put it together. Uh, there's a reason why our society is not called the Society for ACT or the Advancement of ACT. It's called the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. And by contextual behavioral science, we mean behavior analysis from the contextualistic wing with this commitment to a reticulated model of development that is uh, open to traditional behavioral principles and uh, functional contextual principles of language and cognition. Um, so already you're seeing, well for example, if you go to an ACBS conference you'll see FAP people there. They have their own special interest group. Bob Kohlenberg has been to almost every world con. Um, so, you know, Steve, just to make clear, because there is this polemic here in Brazil, so you are saying that CBS is not different from behavior analysis or radical behavior is as a science and as a philosophy. Well, you have to be, it, it, there are some differences. Our embrace of middle level terms, we have a reticulated model of uh, scientific development, not a bottom up model. Uh, we are specifically enthusiastically contextualistic uh, and we have uh, a, an active interest in uh, language and cognition as areas that require new behavioral thinking and you heard me say why Skinner if you really back up you could say Skinner's analysis of language and cognition is based on this idea 540 million year old processes plus culture can equal cognition. I think it's a mistake. I don't think that's true. You know, every organism that evolved in the Cambrian period forward does operant in classical conditioning. None of them before then do. Sponges don't do it. Jellyfish don't do it. Spiders do do it. Snakes do it. Mammals do it, etc. This is an ancient learning process. It's part of why there's such biological diversity because if you look at Sue Schneider's book on the uh, the science of consequences, she really walks through this very nice analysis showing that phenotypic diversity comes from learning processes that allow niche selection, for example, in which evolution can then produce different morphologies. But uh, we're doing something. Hello, we're doing something different right now than the birds outside the window. And it's not simply, I believe, due to culture. But how you know that it's not due to culture? Well, when you do language training, so-called, with um, non-human organisms, 
they don't act like humans, not even like human infants. Uh, for example, well, uh, Carmen Luciano's uh, data with uh, derived relational responding in infants, training bidirectionality, 12-month-old babies start showing you derived mutuality. A, B, they will derive B, A, right? That's never been shown in the language trained chimps. And if, if you really believe that operant conditioning plus culture can equal human language, why not? I mean, we're a part of their culture too. If we're training the chimpanzees or the bonobos or whatever, or the you know, the, the African gray, if you want to go all the way down to Irene Pepperberg's parrot saying, you know, rad, you know, if you think that's language, we're a part of their culture. And so let's look and see. When you do it, they don't do what a human baby does. And if the human baby doesn't show you derived relational responding, they do not develop normal human language. There's not a single instance of a child who fails to derive relations showing normal human language. So, you know, I just am very skeptical of that idea. I think there's new behavioral things that happen. Now, I don't think it's very big. I think it's very, very small. I think all, what, all that it required was a eusocial species in which bidirectionality could expand cooperation. I think eusociality came first, cooperation came first. And then as an extension of cooperation, being able to change listener and speaker roles. You know, like if, if uh, this is a pen, and then I say, where's the pen? You orient towards it. So if you are able to derive uh, the relation between the word pen and this object, you can do it as a speaker. That's a pen. You can do it as a listener. Where's the pen? It's there. Well, that allows you to extend cooperation. I can call to someone else to look for apples. They can tell me if they see them. Uh, you know, it's a very small thing of being able to uh, take th these kind of nonverbal processes of social referencing and uh, joint control and so forth and expand it into an act of cooperation. From that, I think you know, derived relational responding builds out into a large network and comes under arbitrary contextual control. But it's a very, very small step forward. It's, it's operant learning under just a little bit different stimulus control. It just so happens it has such huge effects. The way I usually say it, it would be like if you stood on the edge of a cliff and you go one inch more and then you fall down for a thousand feet. That's what we've been doing for the last uh, tens of thousands of years. It was a very small step, but it's created a huge difference. Uh, as, and this is where Skinner was right, as culture is then able to capture the potentiality of this very small evolutionary advance of being able to put derived relations and perspective taking under arbitrary stimulus control. And that's the basic idea of RFT. It's a very, 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 very simple, very, very small idea, but it's one with profound implications. And I also wanted to ask about uh, evidence-based mm -hmm. research. We, so, we already know that, that ACT works, but there are still many things to be known, I think. Many. One would be why it works. And yes. then to answer this question, we have to go back to basic process and RFT researches. And the other so, question would be how it works. And then the researchers have to decompose the parts of the therapy and see how they work. And then again, we have the problems with the middle terms, the middle level terms, and how to decompose the processes and everything. So how this continue? How, how are we going to build a strong uh, data on evidence-based research about ACT? Yeah. You know, and those concerns were there from the beginning. And why? Because it's part of behavior analysis. So, for example, the very, very first randomized trial ever done uh, was uh, Rob Zettel's dissertation of uh, ACT versus uh, cognitive therapy for But in that study, we created a process measure 
uh, a measure of diffusion by modifying uh, an existing cognitive therapy measure and adding what we thought was more important. So this was uh, the uh, uh, the work on depressogenic thoughts. The, 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 the what is it called? The uh, oh, forgive me. Automatic thoughts questionnaire. And we added instead of whether or not you have these thoughts, to instead when you have this thought, how literally true does it appear to be to you? Okay. By the way, a measure that 20 years later, uh, uh, Adrian uh, Wells put into metacognitive therapy and uh, thought it was his invention, uh, I think. But uh, we were doing the same thing 20 years earlier. Well, and we didn't know mediational analysis then because it hadn't even been talked about in the applied literature. The first big mediational uh, papers, Barron and Kenny in 1986, we were already published that, that article in 1986. As I sit here right now, so uh, if you look at the how and why, we just published a meta-analysis of 66 component analyses of ACT methods. There's now something more like 75 component studies in which very specific ACT elements, little metaphors, exercises, rationales, etc., were tested in the lab. And we published the very first time anyone has been, ever been able to do this because they didn't have enough studies, a meta-analysis of the component analyses done in the laboratory of a clinical method. If there's another one out there, let me know. I don't think there is. We are now working on a meta of mediational analyses of ACT, of which, as I sit here right now, there's somewhere between 30 and 40, more than any other method in uh, applied psychology that I know of. Uh, why? Because all the way back to like the Zettel paper in 1986, hmm. we have done the mediational analysis on that, and sure enough, depression is mediated at follow-up by post changes in the um, fusion with depressogenic thoughts. So now, the, what, the, the other thing you raised though is the how and why can be done at just at an applied level. You could do component analyses, mediational analyses, you have your self-report measures. And as I sit here, I think we're, I'm sorry for what sounds like self-praise, but we just have more studies on these questions than anybody else out there we do. If even CBT, which is a huge area, has fewer good mediational studies that are consistent than we do in the ACT community. But this issue, that would not be enough for us. Let me just finish. That would, that was cool, quickly. That would not be enough for us because you're right. We don't simply want these self-report measures, for example, to sit there uh, without a further analysis. So, for example, uh, there are measures of didactic responding, IU here, there, now, then, and the flexibility of it done in the lab with a very tight RFT preparation. We now know that that measure will combine with psychological flexibility and measures of empathy to predict things like social anhedonia. Do you enjoy being with other people? Which, if you know the literature, is a hugely important process in, in uh, chronic mental illness. And we have some new data coming showing that it's these three things are centrally important to objectification and dehumanization of others, what we're calling polyprejudice. If you take measures of all the different stigmatizing and prejudice and judgmental processes towards women, towards uh, different ethnicities, races, religions, etc., there's a strong central core that's predicted by didactic responding, done in the lab, empathy, and psychological flexibility on that experiential avoidance piece. So we are actively expanding out the how and why to include very tight uh, preparations, measures that go beyond a self-report. Look at the number of IRAP studies. Mm -hmm. Right now there's at least 10 or 15 IRAP studies that are very useful in helping to understand clinical things. We can predict who's going to drop out 
from drug treatment by their IRAPs on the way in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the CBS community takes what you're saying to heart and we're not going to let it stay at the level, even though we're proud of what we've done so far, of traditional component analyses and self-report measures and mediational analyses. Um, and when you finish that whole process, you probably are going to end up with things that are no longer even ACT. I don't know what they're going to be. The, the core of ACT is nothing more than evolution science in, in the clinic. You take tight repertoires and you expand them out. You situate them in the environment for contextual sensitivity, and then you get the right selection criteria with values, and you get retention by practice. This is evolution, variation okay. in the environment with selection and retention. So I don't think those ideas are going to go away. They're too basic, whether you call it or Susie or Fred, call it any name you like. It will be fine, and we can put different methods together and we don't have to worry about names. We can work together as a community to bring the behavioral tradition and the evolution science tradition together uh, into the behavioral sciences. And I've got an article coming out with a major evolutionary biologist, David Sloan Wilson, mm -hmm. and also Tony Bigelin and Dennis Embry. It's in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. It's one of those target articles with a whole bunch of responses. And I uh, hope you, uh, if you're interested in this, you have a look at it. It'll be out in the next few months. Sorry again for the long answers. I know. I'm, not, I'm really not trying to. I'm not trying to avoid questions. Since these are very good questions. Mm -hmm. Great. At least they're good answers too, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, I have a question, Steve. Yes. Uh, about this and and this is studies that you mentioned. Um, and when I started to study ACT and when I do with clients or when I do with students, we see a very interesting change in people. And yeah. in, I would like to ask you, uh, what is the secret, you know? Uh, what do you think there is, the, uh, or if there is a main process or a factor that is a different that make this change? And let me see if I, I'm going to guess at what the changes are that you see and see and read back to Michele and see if this is right. The change uh, that I see that I'm most interested in is unexpected forms of generalization. People start making progress even if you don't necessarily target in a point by point way. And they seem to become uh, somewhat less dependent on the therapy and more. Uh, as if life itself is moving them forward. Does that have any contact with what you're seeing, Michele? Is that the kind of change you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, it's very, very similar. Okay. Yeah, I've, people seem more alive. <laughs> more alive. Okay, exactly. More in their life. Or as the, the book says, get out of your mind into your life. <laughs> you know, I, th <laughs> I think it, it, what, what we're doing here is uh, we're learning how to restrain the excesses of this one repertoire, which is very important, of these kind of verbally based tools for problem solving, for analysis, for rule generation. We're putting it in its place and doing things that increase contingency sensitivity. So, for example, flexible attentional processes. We've sometimes behaviors been afraid of the word attention. It's not a resource that's allocated, etc. It's a skill of uh, of building or diminishing stimulus control. It's a kind of a higher order and as you're able to do that, and as you're able to to back up a little bit from these very dominant verbal problem solving tools and focus more on what really brings vitality. You said you're seeing vitality. If you dig into what's in the values work, mm -hmm. what we're saying is not what are the outcomes you want, but what are the qualities of your behavior that you want that uh, uh, bring vitality to you. Yeah? And unlike the outcomes, which are dependent on other things, the qualities of your action are not. You can do things now that connect with qualities of action that are inherently reinforcing. It, and not be, they, they, are, they are built into the behavior itself. So for example, when you are pursuing your interests 
life will be interesting. You know, the pursuing your interests is inherently interesting, and the interesting features of it is a reinforcer. You're contacting things yeah. that are reinforcers. Mm -hmm. If you are behaving in a loving way, uh, most people will say nothing is more important than, than relationships and, and having love in their life. It's some of the most important things. And they do not mean what I've seen some of these done, it's just terrible kind of almost cartoons of behavioral thinking. They're trying to reduce love to oh, how many sexual encounters have you had or something. No, please. I mean, come on. It's it's much more sophisticated than that. I mean, we can detect a quality of commitment, caring, relationship, intimacy, openness with other human beings. We can detect that. And when we're doing behaviors that bring us in contact with that, reinforcing. It's it's like in the same way that scratching is sometimes reinforcing. You know, so you don't have to come in with arbitrary, oh, good boy, kind of thing. It becomes less dependent on the clinician because it's more dependent on life. I think the reason why the work has this, and I don't want to sound like we have the answers and blah, blah, excuse me, I don't mean to say that. But I do mean to say, and it's Skinner's idea, is that if you understand the basic principles and go after them, you should be able to do a better and better job in complex human behavior. And I think we can simplify the complexity down to taking these repertoire narrowing forces and bringing them under contextual control so that we use them only when they're needed. If you have a three-year-old running across the street and you say, stop, you want repertoire narrowing. Mm -hmm. You want compliance. You want the kid just to stop and not run into the... because you don't want it to going into the road to be contingency-shaped because the consequences are too <laughs> severe for the child. Yeah. But in yeah. many, many areas of our life, we can afford to try many things. We can have a big, fat behavioral distribution and let the contingencies select them. But you want to be in touch with the environment, so you have to have greater ability to be aware, to see that you see from a perspective point of view, and in touch with your environment, able to allocate attention, quote-unquote, in other words, able to narrow or broaden stimulus control as an operant. And then you want selection criteria and behavioral patterns that groove the successful patterns that are selected. This is such uh, simple ideas, really. They're behavioral thinking. But uh, what we missed, I think, was the technology for loosening this the repertoire and narrowing effects of verbal rules. Acceptance and mindfulness gives us that. I think we missed uh, uh, the context sensitivity piece includes uh, this element of awareness. And I think we did miss the conversation about values. Uh, and not just reinforcers, there's a verbal piece there of the kind of reinforcers, which are the ones that are qualitative, ongoing, and uh, non-arbitrarily part of your behavior. Uh, that those three things will will give you a lot, and uh, you don't need, really need ACT to do it. Frankly, it's just uh, ACT uh, does open the door, and then other techniques will walk into the same space. I think that's happening right now with compassion-focused therapy, DBT, um, uh, FAP, and so forth. And um, we don't have to worry about the who the names and all of that. This is focused on the processes, and uh, all of those differences will work out. I hope that applies to the things that have been developed in Brazil. Some of these things I may not know about, but I hope they do in terms of how to uh, maybe even add to some of the things that you found out about uh, mm -hmm. contingency sensitivity and how to promote it. Mm -hmm. oh. well. um, okay. In an interview that was published here in Brazil some years ago, I uh, was writing that you said that uh, you treat uh, a psycholo uh, psychotic in three days. <laughs> Is this the yeah, one in Asia? It's, it's, Is that in the yeah, yellow pages? Yeah, yeah, it's, ah, yeah. yeah first, it's true. <laughs> and well, how I... do you do that? <laughs> 
my my wife, you know, we were when when the Get Out of Your Mind came out, it had a very long story in Time magazine. And she said, Oh, that's very nice, very nice, honey, I'm proud of you. And then we got the call that it was I was uh in the two yellow pages. She yeah. jumped out of bed, she said, Oh my god, oh my god, she started calling her family. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's in Asia. Oh, so. <laughs> much more important. <laughs> much more important. Much more important. <laughs> now the the studies on psychosis, those early studies, um, are kind of shocking. There are two, as you probably know. It was replicated by a very careful research team by uh, Brandon Gadiano, who's a student of. Uh, 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 at at uh, uh, Drexel of James Herbert, and um, what was in those three hours, four sessions, was basically these are people who are in the mental hospital, revolving door patients. Uh, it was most successful with people whose primary problem was hallucinations, not delusions. I think hallucinations is a focus of avoidance. Delusions are a means of avoidance. It's harder to use ACT there. You can do it, but it's harder. But especially with those who primarily have hallucinations, just getting them to back up a little bit and to watch their hallucinations the way you might uh, watch a thought uh, gives you a little gap in which behavioral alternatives can occur other than resisting or agreeing or complying or running from the hallucinations. Um, we have a measure of that, that now, and we know that uh, psychological flexibility with regard to voices is very important in predicting positive outcomes. And as you probably know, I mean, there's a lot of people who hear voices through their ears, not in their mind, who function quite well, thank you, uh, and never need treatment. Uh, and there's others who have done very wonderful things. Uh, Stephen Nash won a Nobel Prize. Uh, he has a psychosis, and but if you look at how he did it, he did it by this combination of accepting the voices in the movie A Beautiful Mind that was done as yes. visually because they needed something that would translate to a movie. But in that movie, you see, I see you there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you, so we're <laughs> going to reduce entanglement. Why? Because of my family and my work and its values. That right. combination of open up, notice, shift your attention towards what you care about. No, it, it doesn't cure the psychosis, but it helps these brave and courageous people who are dealing with with these symptomatology who so often are stigmatized and judged and almost force-fed very, very strong medications with terrible side effects and so forth. It gives, a, gives us a more respectful place uh, to work with them and to give them, I think, more choice inside uh, their lives. And I'm very excited, you know, I always go in an ACT meeting, if there's a thing on psychosis, I go. Because um, it's one of those things, like if there's a thing on people in jails, I go. <laughs> there are certain populations where we have just almost written people off. We've almost said they don't count. They don't matter. You know, human beings. And psychotic people have been treated that way. People who are... Uh, in prison have been treated that way. And uh, I don't care if we don't make a lot of money from our private practice. As psychologists, if we don't care, who is going to care uh, for these people who are suffering so much? Um, you know, people who are psychotic, I think, almost should like win an award for getting up in the morning and walking out on the street. Because if you had that level of challenge, many of you would not pass the test. And uh, so I have heart for the work, and I think there is the possibility of getting a little more flexibility. You know, one of the interesting things on psychosis, I know we're going late, but you know in the early days how they vetted 
uh, pharmacotherapy when they were trying to learn how uh, which drugs might the, being so-called antipsychotics. Does anybody know the preparation, the animal preparation you'd use? No. Because all these drugs, the phenothiazines and so forth, were per first studied in the animal lab. Well, here's what you do. You create an avoidance and escape learning paradigm. Mm -hmm. And you'd look for chemicals that didn't reduce escape, but did reduce avoidance. And the, okay. that's the filter. Mm -hmm. And I look okay. at the data I look at the data on psychosis and I see things like this. If you move from one language community to another in the mm -hmm. early years, your likelihood of getting a psychosis later on in life just went up about 100% or 60% or something. Wow. It was a huge jump. And so mm -hmm. it, you think like, well, why would that be? It can't just be genetic. It cannot. Even identical twins, you know, the, you know that one can be psychotic, one not. There, there's a piece in there. If you hit people with aversives at a particular place in development, and they kind of mishandle it psychologically. There's a piece in there that is uh, a kind of avoidance learning. I think this experiential avoidance idea in psychosis is uh, is going to turn out as important. Now, how we're going to turn it into psychotherapies? We have some early work with ACT. We have four randomized trials, um, but it's also clear we just did a, a longer trial and a better controlled trial in Australia. We did get differences, we did get some positive benefits, but uh, it's also clear that there's a lot to learn. So uh, mm -hmm. we know it's relevant. We don't yet know how. Uh, it's going to take a community to do that. As we get people who have heart for these specific populations, how to our traditional behavioral ideas, some of these newer ACT and RFT ideas, and put them together into packages that really work for the uh, people we serve. But it's not going to be one size fits all. And everything, you know, you just use the same ACT protocol. It's not like that. The processes, though, they're relevant. Yes, they're relevant. How to move them. That varies. Yeah, uh, we, are at it. we are talking for about an hour and a few minutes. We have to finish our session, but I, I think Rodrigo has one question, and Cesar still has one, right? Okay. Okay, so, we, so we're going to try these two questions and then we have to finish, but okay, who's okay. going first? Me? Okay. So, Stephen, uh, I think uh, it's a, uh, there's a, a clear call for participation uh, in the 2012 yeah, 2012 Meno for development of fact. Uh, what do you expect for future right now? Uh, I'm already wearing my handcuffs. <laughs> 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 uh, I do you think, think there's a lot of FAP. Uh, well, FAP has always been part of ACT. It co-developed. I mean, uh, Barbara Kohlenberg was in my lab when ACT was being developed before there was a FAP and uh, told her father about the things we're doing and, and Bob will credit the work we we're doing early work on rule governed behavior and on ACT as sort of getting him interested again in what he could do with his behavioral training. So he had gone more psychoanalytic, Bob Kohlenberg. But yes, the FAP connection is there. I think you're, you see a lot of the compassion focused people and mindfulness people are coming. I'm noticing just in terms of communities, I know it's not exactly the question you're asking, but that there's more humanistic, existential, gestalt people right now, and even analytic people. Some of this is as it should be. Forgive me for the spending the time mentioning it, but you know, to take something like gestalt therapy, um, you know, they have been very far away from behavioral thinking and have sometimes treated us as the enemy. But the very first uh, gestalt therapy book was written by Fritz Perls, Paul Goodman, who is a psychoanalyst. And Ralph Hefferlein. Does anybody here know who Ralph Hefferlein was? No. He was a rat running behavior analyst at Columbia. He was a colleague of Fred Keller. Hmm. And, and he had a, a class called The Psychology of um, 
personal development or something. And all of those cool exercises in Gestalt, he wanted to call Gestalt therapy integrative behavior therapy and because it integrated radical behaviorism and humanistic thinking. The history of psychology would have been different if he won that argument. But Fritz Perls thought that classic Wertheimer Gestalt was coming back, so he called it Gestalt therapy. So there's there were a lot of opportunities missed and misunderstandings that occurred between the behavioral wing and other wings. Tragically, even evolutionary perspectives, which makes no sense. Skinner was really one of the first evolutionary psychologists. But also uh, some of these humanistic traditions, which after all experience and experiment come from the same root. You know, the experimental analysis and experiential tradition are both about, you know, grounding your feet in contact in and with the world, you know. It does it was no reason for them to be split apart. So I expect going forward to see a process oriented, principle oriented and growing that mixes up the traditional divisions. I want behavioral psychology, the way I tell my students, treat it as a foundation. Don't use it as a fence. You don't build walls between you and others. Mm -hmm. Use it to put your feet firmly on the ground. And that when your feet are firmly on the ground, you don't have to say, oh, you're saying it the wrong way. That's stupid. No, you listen carefully to what they're saying. See if it makes sense. Bring your own ideas to it and then get into a genuine conversation. And when you do that, I think uh, communities can, can find ways through these uh, differences. Uh, I hope that uh, ACT and CBS is part of a, of a real shift in the field to bring evidence-based, monistic, naturalistic accounts into areas of human complexity in a way that is respectful, but that doesn't genuflect. We don't turn science over to the monks. We don't turn it over to the philosophers, even though philosophy is important. We have to <laughs> come in there with this combination uh, of openness, humility, but also with clarity about what we bring to it. Uh, the other thing I do expect to see is I expect to see ACT moving to and ACT sensitivities out of the clinic and into, and, and RFT as well, into organizations, schools, community-based work, education. A lot of these things won't look like ACT. A lot of these things will look, uh, they're going to come out of RFT. There's some wonderful, new, exciting things coming after, out of RFT. In, uh, you know, in my country, we're trying to uh, solve this terrible problem with our health care system. And uh, so-called Obamacare is being implemented. Mm -hmm. My state, when they wanted to know how do we reach all these different people, uh, they uh, decided to use an IRAP to look at all of their advertising. And we helped them. And we were able to help them find images and words that would appeal to different ethnicities, different age groups, people with different religious backgrounds without... Because when you put something on television, you can't control who's looking at it. Yeah? So you have to know. And we found some things where if you did focus groups, they would do it one way. If you did implicit cognition, you'd do it the other way. Well, that's bad. Because what that means is that the immediate cognitive response is one way, and the more elaborated one is the other way. That's a bad idea because by the time you elaborate it, you might have changed the channel. You mm -hmm. may have turned off, right? So there's excitement, not, not just act, but CS, and it's a behavioral idea. You know, I came into behavior analysis because of Walden II. And the reason I'm a behavior analyst, an analyst is because of Walden too. I mean, I lived on a commune. I thought it was just cool that this psychologist would talk about how you could go from rats to relationships. And so as an undergraduate, you know, I'm running my rats and I'm talking about utopian fantasies and later on lived on a commune. To, to kind of, I think that is... Um, no, we don't know, really know how to do that, but to have the aspiration to do that, that we could develop a psychology. That's what we mean by creating a psychology more worthy of the challenge of the human condition. We mean it, could we 
go back to Skinner's vision of a psychology that was very technically precise on the one hand, but very bold in its vision, without being narcissistic, without being thinking it has all the answers, but that had the aspiration that we're going to actually do something about our, the, the poor, that we'll do something about uh, people who have been abused, that we'll do something about our economic system or our healthcare system or our families or our orga pro-social organizations. I know I'm a little long, if I could take just 60 seconds. I'm seeing the same fervor in the evolution science group. So, for example, David Sloan Wilson, myself, Tony Bigman, a few others, are involved right now in combining ACT with Eleanor Ostrom's ideas. She won the Nobel Prize in 2009. I spent a few days with her. She's dead now, unfortunately, died of cancer. But she was a political scientist who uh, understood or did the research on how uh, indigenous peoples can protect their common pool resources and came up with principles that are really principles as to how you build pro-social groups. And at the time to tell you what they are, you would recognize them immediately as, as solid, behaviorally sensible principles. That's an example. Could we bring psychology and evolutionary biology together to do things like, you know, how can we create groups that are successful, that really care about the downtrodden or that uh, are there for the people who need our services. And so I expect to see ACT and CBS breaking out of the clinic and uh, not breaking out in the sense of no longer concerned with the clinic, but taking some of what we've learned there and being able to bring the parts that really work and scale them out that old behavioral idea that you can scale all the way up w with care uh, to uh, human culture and human development more generally. Uh, maybe it's grandiose. I'm sorry for that if it is, but I learned it from a, a Skinner, and so I, don't blame me. That's our tradition. <laughs> I think it's great how ACT and you guys are trying to talk to, to evolutionists and to all kind all of other science and this talk and how we are used to be locked in ourselves with our ter with with our, ter with our theory and so it's it's great to see that. I guess yeah I agree with this here. I guess you are more aware than lots of behavior analysts that aren't aware that this is vital for our community our community and our science to survive. Yes. So, for the last question, uh, I'll try to elaborate it. Maybe Robert would like to complete. But Stephen, I know that you established some links uh, between ACT and some Eastern traditions of thinking, such as Buddhism. So, in your view, what are the main things that we could learn from these traditions yeah. as psychologists? And I wanted to, to complete this question, Steve, because I know uh, you had an experience uh, in India, I think. And I wanted to know if you can talk uh, to us, if you can tell us, uh, if you try to translate the experience you had to, you know, behavior terms or what happened there to you that made you use uh, these things in your therapy. Uh. I didn't have an experience in India, though I've been part of Eastern uh, traditions, and like many people who've explored these traditions, there are uh, interesting spaces that show up inside the contemplative traditions that I think are uh, provide uh, a guidance uh, to you. So I don't know the exact story you're referring to, but let me talk in peace a little bit. All of the major world's religions have a mystical wing to them. Buddhism, yes. Hinduism, of course. Uh, Christianity, yes. Judaism, yes. Uh, the uh, Muslims and Sufis, yes. All of the mystical traditions, every single one, has practices that rein in judgmental, problem-solving, analytical modes of thinking whether that's a Zen koan, or chanting, or silence, or dance, they have something that goes after 
the excesses of human language. These are very ancient things, and they are thousands of years old because at the point at which our initially co cooperation of cooperation as a eusocial species, the social primates, the tribal primates, as we use communication initially to extend cooperation, but then it evolved into a problem-solving method, and it came back on us. And you are not but three or four or five years old when you start feeling as though you're different. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. If you have, if you go back, you can find a strand, even if you had a very good childhood, where you began to be worried if you were smart enough, if you'll be accepted, or whether you'll be loved, or if other people are like you, and you felt as though you were somehow strange. And for children who've been abused, who really had tough environments, it, that is put on steroids. And uh, the the spiritual and religious traditions are based in mystical experience. Almost all of the major religious leaders were not uh, the people who have the wagging finger with the list of um, dogmas. They came later. The rule givers came later, you know. The mystics came first. And what did they see? Almost always what they talk about is what they see is common humanity, or the importance of compassion, the importance of self-kindness, the importance of awareness, of seeing oneness and connection. And all of those things I think we can uh, begin to understand in behavioral terms. And that is why that first article, Making Sense of Spirituality, makes sense to me that it would be the first article. Because really what that article is about is trying to find as a way into a different way of thinking this experience of transcendence and what is it. Uh, I think if you can connect people to the things that our mystical traditions are talking about, in ways that don't require necessarily participation in a social and religious, in a religious and spiritual community. Nothing, I don't want to take away from the importance of religion and spirituality. It's just that if you're going to put something into the healthcare system, you can't put it that way. If you're going to put it into schools or into organizations or into our politics, you can't put it in that way. Uh, or at least if you can, we're not the ones to do it. I mean, the nuns and the priests and the monks and the spiritual leaders have been doing that forever. There's nobody, just because we got PhDs or master's degree, who nominated us to be leaders of that kind. But we can delve deeply into these processes, pull them at their joints. Uh, uh, the way I say it is you do it with genuflection. Because as scientists, we're not going to genuflect in front of anyone. Not even a scientist, but especially not spiritual religious leaders whose knowledge come out of a different knowledge development system. And what I, you know, what I found not just in Buddhism but in mysticism was the reining in of the excesses of literal analytical problem-solving language, self-kindness, self-compassion, a broader sense of self that I think makes self makes sense of transcendence. In this very, and the didactic frames really make sense of it. It isn't just I, it's I, you. It just isn't just here, it's here, there. It's not just now, it's now, then. And so consciousness connected to the I, here, nowness of awareness that allows you to make verbal reports from a consistent point of view is connected to processes that connect you to what's going on behind the eyes of other people and of, by, by uh, memory and thought other places at other times. So if you know somebody is suffering in Bangladesh right now, to some degree it's diminishing your psychology. It hurts you because you can put yourself behind the eyes of the child who's being abused, who doesn't have enough to eat. And I don't care how fast you turn the channel to not see it. It's in your head and it diminishes you in some way if you aren't able to carry that. And I, I think that's inside of Buddhism. It's inside all of the major religions, and why can't we put it inside our psychology? 
and, and I think there's good reasons to do it, to do it. I think we can see the processes that make sense of that, and and they have this remarkable stuff like the compassion focused therapy folks who now come to ACBS is a reason why they're there, just focusing on the compassion towards others. You start stepping up in a more vital way in your life. This is very sensible psychologically, and there is none of the spiritual leaders would be surprised. Why should we be surprised? I think it's because our psychology has not been delving in enough depth to these complex topics. So I've written a paper on Buddhism and ACT where I tried to go point to point. I had a um, Zen Buddhist in India, Amasami, go through it line by line and say, yes, that's because I don't really know Buddhism. He had to look and say, yeah, that your understanding fits with what, I'm, what I know of Buddhism. Um, and let's get a dialogue going uh, that uh, allows us to carry what's important forward inside our psychology work. I don't know if that's an adequate answer. It probably isn't <laughs> to talk, talking about my own spiritual experiences, but um, uh, hopefully there's some, something useful there. Yeah, it was. Well, uh, before we finish, does anybody wants to say something to close? Maybe advertise something or. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for example, uh, Stephen, I know you have a few online groups and seminars, websites for people who want to learn more about ACT and these things. Maybe you want to talk about them right now. Well, the only the, oh, I do I do have some and even some that are commercial, but let me do one that is not, which is ACVS. I mean, mm -hmm. soon enough there'll be a Brazilian or Portuguese uh, chapter. Uh, there are people <laughs> on this call who've been thinking about that, talking about that, <laughs> uh, and around the world, you know, there's seven thousand members of ACVS right now, and we're building a community that is very interesting. It's just an, if if you get on that website and you get on the listserv and you watch. It has an interesting quality. And I think what's going on is if you take these acceptance, mindfulness, values-based processes and you put them into organizations deliberately, which is what we've tried to do with ACBS, uh, it changes the quality of the organizations in an interesting way. That's why we're working with David Sloan Wilson and his uh, project called Pro Social, trying to do that with groups in general. So uh, the website, it's www.contextualscience.org or contextualpsychology.org. Either way will get you there. And if you're not a member of that group, it is uh, very inexpensive. We have what we call values-based dues, meaning you pay what you think the worth work is worth based on your ability to pay, as long as it's $10. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we say as long as, long as it's $10 is that we have to pay the publisher for our journal. That's why. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be zero. But it's an interesting thing. When we went from required dues, if you're a professional, it has to be at least $60, etc. And we went to values-based dues. Our dues actually went slightly up. Because some people like me, you know, I'll pay three, four, five hundred dollars, you know, because I feel like, golly, that's minimal. I have to write a big check like that in terms of the value to me. Other people who are, you know, writing ten dollar checks, and uh, but uh, there's a vast set of resources that are there that are basically for free, and almost everything, like our our protocols, our measures, we trademark, or rather we copyright, so that nobody else can restrict them, and then we give them away. So there's almost no selling that's going on. Now there is books and there's workshops. We're doing fine. I and mean, it's not that we're not inside a real world where we make money. But it doesn't have to all be about making money to do that. We can have it be about uh, being of service to others. And um, So if you have, don't know, if there's anything in I've, what I've said that is of interest to I encourage you to explore it and uh, see if it has some qualities that are useful to you. Once you're a member, you can join the listserv just by setting your membership settings and watch the conversation. Uh, there is also a listserv in Portuguese, but I don't know how active it is. You may know. Mikael, your others who are involved may know. Yeah, yeah we, share, we share that feeling with you. After all, Boteco Behaviorista is free too, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
actually, we love that, to do it. Actually, there's no money. <laughs> <laughs> there's some cost. To... <laughs> maybe maybe it's great to say that every year the ACBS has a, a conference, a meeting. There is uh, and next yes. year will be in United States in Minneapolis and. The past three years I've been attending to it, and it's an amazing conference. I think we all could go together like we have been doing through these last three years and make this Brazilian uh, airplane. And oh, absolutely. It will, be in, it will be in Brazil the following uh, <laughs> yeah. no, in, in uh, Berlin the following year. But uh, soon enough, it needs to be in Brazil. So Should I'm it? looking forward yeah. to the day. One we'll day, one day you're gonna make it. <laughs> we, will, we will make it. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah, it's for sure. Happen. You'll figure out a way. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, a, have a very finish. nice chat. Uh, I, yeah, I would love work. to. Yeah, I would love to to keep hearing your ideas, your thoughts, but we we have to finish. Yes. Yeah. It's late, it's late already. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for accepting our invitations. Uh, Roberta, Desiree, uh, Mika, Rodrigo, Steven, and thank you. That's all. Thank you. Oh. Ciao, gente. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, everybody, for watching us and having patience with our poor English. Had a shirt. No, <laughs> the our next market is not had a shirt. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.